Welcome to CIHT Podcasts. Yeah, so what I was trying to do was just to, well, grab people's attention, basically, you know, sort of, and especially in the context of uh, liability, responsibility, you know, because a big risk is the fact that people become complacent. You know, they, they well, well, this bridge has stood there for decades. Uh, it's not going to fall down, is it? And sadly, you know, occasionally things do fall down. And, and when it does, um, almost inevitably, you know, there will be a huge inquiry and there will be someone at fault. And uh, Mirandi was uh, absolutely the case. In the, and there are some pretty serious prosecutions still going through the system. So I, I, I would be very surprised if there aren't a few guys in court uh, and probably in prison. Bridge collapses and grand challenges. What are the lessons from the Genoa Bridge collapse? Welcome to the CHT podcast. I'm your host, Justin Ward. And in this episode, I'm pleased that I could speak with Richard Fish, a chartered bridge engineer with extensive experience in the industry. In the year of a pandemic, understanding risk has become part of our public discourse. Today, we try and answer the question, what risk do bridges in the UK face? And what are the grand challenges that we need to solve for our bridge sector more widely? To start exploring this, I asked Richard what caused the Mirandi Motorway Bridge to collapse in Genoa on the 14th of August, 2018, killing 43 people. So I'm Richard Fish. I, uh, for the last 12 years, I've been a independent consultant uh, specialising in bridge asset management. Uh, I have had previous experience of mm, 30 odd years as a, in local authority with um, various responsibilities for designing, uh, constructing, maintaining bridges. I'm a past chair of the UK Bridges Board and the then CSS uh, Bridges Group and uh, I presently sit as the technical secretary of the Bridge Owners Forum. Um, I mean, yeah, why did it happen? It's a long story. Uh, so I'll try and keep it as brief as I can. But so Bridge uh, was managed and maintained by Autostrada, who's the sort of private company looking after Italy's motorways. And it, well, for a start, it was a bit of a maintenance liability. You know, it hadn't been designed with maintenance in mind, um, especially the, the most critical element of the bridge, which are the, the uh, pre-stressed concrete stay cables, for want of a better word. And they were just totally impossible to inspect. And this was built in the 60s, early 60s, when uh, the use of pre-stressed concrete was uh, well not not unusual but you know it, it was still a bit innovative and especially in the way that Mirandi had designed the bridge uh, and there was always a risk and again hindsight's a wonderful thing but there's always a risk that you could see water getting inside those cables and you'd have absolutely no idea what was going on in there so potentially yeah it was a bit of a, a time bomb and Autostrada realised this and had already started to do some strengthening. So I think there were, there were three main pylons. And even on the photographs of the collapsed bridge, you can see the, the, the first pylon, uh, which I think was the oldest, had this huge amount of strengthening up at the top and recognising that there was an issue. And thereafter, um, they apparently had plans to uh, also strengthen the other two pylons. Um, for whatever reason, that didn't happen. I should imagine there was sort of budget issues. I should imagine there was uh, pressure to um, maintain, dare I say, potholes. You know, that's, that's what everyone's uh, bet noir is. But so, and that part of the bridge wasn't maintained. And I believe that the main cause was, as I mentioned, water getting in at the, the top, uh, causing corrosion within the, the 
very stressing uh, tendons uh, and just reached the point where the load was too great and it, and it failed. And not only did it fail, but it also failed obviously very catastrophically because there was absolutely no redundancy. So we, as engineers, we think of um, a redundancy is such that if an element either fails or needs to be replaced, um, there's enough of the bridge still left to be able to keep it open or preventing collapse. So yeah, Mirandi's bridge had none of those. Uh, and so yeah, failure was almost uh, instantaneous. It always amuses me, you look at the, uh, the, the typical disaster films of um, bridges collapsing and heroes running up and down on it, but, you know, creaking and plenty of time to get off. But these, in real life, it's just a, a snap of the fingers and it's gone. Yeah, I've heard some of the footage of uh, of the time when you can hear people's recordings of, I mean, it's absolutely horrendous because how, uh, there was a number of deaths, wasn't there, from that? Yeah, uh, 43, I think. Um, and uh, so the new bridge is now being built and the, it, it actually has 43 lamp columns over it, which are intended, I think, to, to represent the, uh, you know, the, the fatalities. But um, yeah, so that one, uh, yeah, 43, uh, there was the I-35W in 2007, we were discussing, that was uh, 13. You know, the, the, the list of bridge collapses and uh, fatalities is, is yeah, it's, it's not pleasant reading by any means. And it's, I think I've looked in the first 20 years of this century now, um, total number of people killed due to collapsing bridges is just fractionally under 1,000. So it's quite, quite sobering. And I think, again, it comes back to this issue of responsibility, you know, and all of us engaged either designing, building, maintaining our bridges, you know, you, you, we have to remember that, that the, the implicit trust of the travelling public is, is on us, isn't it? So we, you know, it's, uh, but I, 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 I just worry that occasionally it's, it's all too easy to come up with computer models and nice graphics. Uh, and, and people just perhaps lose sight of, you know, the, the responsibility that they have. And after the I-35 collapse, the headline in the paper, and I think you were interviewed at the time, was could it happen here? In in light of the the findings in a recent piece just from the Times where they reported nearly half the bridges on England's busiest roads have key sections in a poor or very poor condition, uh, they've uh, found that 4,000 of the 9,000 bridges and large culverts on motorways and A roads show evidence of defects or damage that may significantly affect their capacity. Should we be worried here? Uh, well, um, without wanting to be scaremongering, I think yes, we should. You know, it's, it's but but what's needed is uh, investment. You know, without any doubt, and and this is the classic problem. And we're seeing it in this country as well, because, you know, we, we have a, a huge network of various types of infrastructure, uh, all of which need to be maintained, looked after. And yet the emphasis is always seems to be on let's build something else. Let's build something new. And the Americans are the, the classic ones here because they uh, I looked at some figures the other day and they have. Uh, I forget what it is, but thousands or maybe even hundreds of thousands of either structurally deficient or functionally obsolete bridges. Those are the terms they, they use. And of all their capital budget, which could be spent on maintenance, it's only about 40 percent is spent on maintaining those older bridges. And the other 60 percent is still building new ones. And we're just as bad in this, this country. So I'm not really surprised that I was England's figures. Um, I, I don't think it tells the full picture because I think they have uh, a good regime in place. And whilst they understand 
you know, that they do have bridges in those categories, they will be being prioritised, they will be being monitored. And what we have in this country, and I don't know that many other countries do have it, is a system where when a bridge is uh, what we call substandard, it, uh, it, there's a specific strategy for managing substandard bridges. Uh, which means that usually a, a much more enhanced inspection regime. You know, we we understand where the the hot spots are, where the weak points, and as well as those bridges having a higher priority, they will also, as I said, be under some formalised monitoring regime, so that, that you know they will know that where their their weaknesses are. But uh, the, the risk, you know, and, and it is a risk, is that there are bridges out there, and it may be not highways England, it may not be local authority, maybe bridges in private ownership, who knows, which aren't having the same level of inspection. And one of my concerns, and it was has been for a long time now, is the the capacity and capability of people who are charged with managing bridges. And it's is partly, I guess, my local government background, which you know I haven't worked in local government for in that 12 years. I know that budgets have been cut, and people are being stretched. Uh, and the, the tendency, I'm sure, in and especially in smaller local authorities who are still looking after fairly significant bridges, uh, the tendency there has been for. Uh, amalgamating posts so somebody who is perhaps a, you know, looking after street lighting looking after drainage may suddenly be saying oh by the way you're looking after bridges as well without the necessary expertise and also without the budget you know this it's i won't name names but the, one of my uh, local authority contacts is annual budget looking after all these bridges is basically 50 pounds a bridge you can't even inspect a bridge for, for 50 pounds it's so that if it is going to happen here it will be because uh, the standards of maintenance have fallen so they the, the, the risk increases and, and my worry is that there are some bridge owners who won't even be aware of that they won't even understand the full implications, how the bridge works, you know, what its failure mechanism is likely to be, is it safe to keep it open? You know, th those are huge decisions and the risk, my fear, is that uh, those decisions aren't being taken at the right level. So, and then it, so I mentioned investment. Investment's not just money, it's also in people and, you know, we need to have the right numbers and the right uh, qualifications and the right experience in everyone who's looking after bridges in the UK. Uh, there is the REC Foundation research on bridges on local authority levels that probably helps tell a story to make that case. What is what is that story then? So the REC Foundation are, are, are very helpful in that uh, you know they they send out this annual survey and like any form of statistic. You know the, the the instant snapshots aren't that helpful, but what you're looking for is trends. And at least with the, the RIC Foundation, you're seeing annual results, so you can plot that trend. And to be honest, it's it's not going in the direction we'd like it to go. Um, but the RIC Foundation do have uh, a good platform. They're a good uh, organisation. They've got a good PR machine. So at least it does raise awareness and uh, awareness, not just to the public, but I think also, um, and especially, as you say, they focus on local authorities. They, they it, it actually becomes quite challenging, I think, then for uh, the elected members, you know, the, the councillors who uh, look after or it's their democratic responsibility to, to look after everything in their patch. And whilst there will be huge pressures on, on budgets, I, I recognise that, 
uh, I think it's a, a bit of a wake up call for those councillors who are deciding the budgets. And, you know, again, I know some bridge engineers on national or local authority level who are actually very good at protecting their budgets because, you know, they make their local members uh, or the council at large portfolio holders fully aware of what the implications are if anything should go wrong. And if, if you know, if under the Mirandi Bridge in Genoa, the, uh, you know, there are guys going to appear in court, if it was to be the case in this country, uh, it's just as likely that it would be a, a politician um, in the firing line, especially if they had been advised that, you know, they needed to invest more and they decided not to. They, they would be there. You know, they, they, they need to be as aware as engineers do of their responsibilities and the risk that they face. Just the parallels with the sort of major iconic bridges closing, the Hammersmith flyover and the yep. fourth bridge. Is the yep. kind of parallels or is there some kind of connection to the Mirandi Bridge and what we did that was different? I mean, obviously there was closures there. Uh, before something uh, awful happened. So yeah. how close uh, were we with those? So yeah, Hammersmith uh, flyover uh, was, uh, well, still is, a, a very complex uh, structure. Um, a lot of precast concrete when it was built, a lot of innovative uh, post-tensioning and uh, pre-stress, a lot of quite tricky details. So that made it also difficult to build uh, and workmanship perhaps wasn't as good as it could have been and uh, there were some issues you know then and mostly it's all about water getting in um, it because the other innovation which never really worked with with Hammersmith was that um, they decided that uh, there was no need to waterproof the bridge because the main problem is always going to be uh, de-icing salts and to overcome that they actually put um, wires in the top slab which uh, would heat up and effectively <laughs> prevent ice forming on the bridge so that was one of those sort of seems like a good idea but in fact uh, didn't work that well and without the waterproofing the, the uh, corrosive salts are able to get in and even more damage to the, the post tensioning so but the, the reason that it it was recognized uh, was really transport for London's very effective um, inspection regime. So they were able to get inside, see what the problem was, work out quite what the remaining factor of safety was. And yeah, a difficult decision. Again, partly a political decision, but um, the right decision to, to close the bridge uh, at, at that time. And since then, again, very clever, innovative, strengthening works uh, have, have been put in place and it's it's up and running. Now fourth road bridge uh, suffered the, uh, the complete failure of one of the, the truss end links um, and uh, when that happened obviously the bridge had to be closed and uh, eventually as a, as a result the following year the, um, the Scottish Parliament held a, a, a committee of in inquiry into why that had happened and I was asked to give us some evidence and uh, I, I had some association at the time with uh, the previous uh, bridge manager and uh, I said at the inquiry that there's probably no better bridge in the UK that's been maintained as well as fourth or throw bridge including inspections and again they, they were sort of aware that that was an issue and wanting to address it at some point budget didn't quite allow for that. Um, but in, in terms of understanding the bridge and, and working out what the level of the risk is, I, you know, I was convinced that they, they had done the right thing, but they did have something in, in hand. So there was, it, again, the inspection regime that was in place for both of those bridges meant that, it, you know, they're actually eyes wide open. You know, they, they knew what was going on. And the, the outcome uh, as a, a, a nice consequence of the fourth road bridge uh, was certainly a, a greatly enhanced.
bridge maintenance budget, not just on Forth, but across all of Transport Scotland, because again, the the politicians recognised that at that time, yeah, there was a big issue, and it, and it wasn't a case of engineers saying, oh, this could fail, but actually it had failed, and uh, that was a bit of a wake up call, and so uh, yeah, it was in this case uh, an ill wind. But as I say, the most important thing is that they they knew they understood what was going on. You know, they, they knew there was a hotspot, likely point of failure, inspection regime enhanced, and uh, okay, the failure happened before they got round to putting in the repairs. But at least they were on top of their game. You know, there was the, so there, there there are some good examples. So even though you know there are some particular issues with those two bridges. The fact is they didn't collapse. The fact is nobody was killed because you know we had good, capable people looking after them. Bridge Owners Forums set up and released the document Grand Challenges, which are things that are incredibly difficult, I think, challenges, difficult, difficult problems which require solutions. Could you just tell me what the Grand Challenges are then for the bridge community? Uh, yeah, sure. So the brand challenge is, um, it, it is a, a sort of concept, I think, initially, and it, it just provides a bit of a focus and objective. So the Bridge Owners Forum spent a long time uh, actually having really good conversations and discussions about what those grand challenges should be. And in the end, we, we ended up with, with, with five. And uh, Three of the five are uh, answer the or provide the the answer to the question what should happen, um, and the other two uh, are about how how we should resolve those. So the, the first one is uh, to prevent um, bridge failures. You know we don't want any failures at all, and this is obviously part of what we've been discussing. And then we focus a bit more on uh, existing structures and our, our next emphasis the second grand challenge is to extend the life of existing structures which sort of means you do a bit more than just maintain them you know you you, you invest in them you uh, it's, it's a bit bit like house you know if you if you want your windows to last a long time you know you, you can slap a coat of paint on them every couple of years but to really improve the value of your house and to make it last even longer you ultimately you have to replace the windows so it's the same thing with existing structures that's let's, let's try and get as much life out of them as you possibly can and the corollary of that is if you don't do that obviously you they don't last as long they become weak they either fail or they have to be replaced and a lot more money is is being spent on uh, replacing than you could on maintaining uh, and then we're just moving on to um, new new designs and making sure that the bridges we build in the future will perform better uh, so the Mirandi bridge in Genoa and Hammersmith Viaduct, um, all of those sorts of examples where we don't want those sorts of things to happen again. So we want the bridges we're building for the future to, to last longer. So that that's really a, a grand challenge around uh, design. And the the two grand challenges about how we do that is one is to um, uh, really embrace innovation and uh, new technology and Part of that works towards uh, use of BIM and um, ultimately the, the concept of the digital twin. So the, the, that which really means the, the bridge that you have on on the on the on the ground, the, the concrete, steel, etc., is actually modelled digitally, and you uh, actually make the um, the digital model uh, behave as the existing bridge. So you, you put sensors in the existing bridge and you calibrate the, the digital model. And in in theory, you know that gives you the, the opportunity to just test 
when some components uh, will deteriorate, you know, actually make the, make sure that you're fully aware of that and to uh, remodel it in, in the digital twin. So th that's a sort of more of a long term way that we would uh, address that. Um, and then the last grand challenge is about the workforce and uh, we the, the, the phrase or the word which uh, comes through here is a workforce which is competent you know that they they actually are able to do the job that's asked of them and that that is not just that engineers designing bridges it's it's inspectors carrying out inspections uh, which partly links into the, the bridge inspector certification scheme which um, uh, UK Bridges Board and BOF have been promoting over the years just to ensure that whoever is carrying out this work is able to do it properly and safely and uh, that competency needs to run right away from yeah, as I say the, the inspectors right through to the uh, the, the guy at the top who's chief bridge engineer or whatever uh, description he might have to make sure he's competent, he's got the right capacity and he's got the right capability, sets of skills. So those are basically the, the five um, grand challenges and you can weave all sorts of other stuff into that. And you know, the, the, the contexts are everything from uh, you know, sustainability to dealing with climate change, uh, through to embracing new materials, everything that's uh, you know can be actually slotted into one of those five grand challenges. So yeah, they're, and they're out there now, and uh, we are looking at opportunities to uh, to promote them. But I think yeah, on the whole, they've been pretty widely accepted uh, by the bridge community. So, but what we mustn't do is, is you know the old uh, you know the old concept of the, the new report comes out and it. You know, it's all very interesting, but it's put on somebody's shelf. All right, these days it's a virtual shelf, but um, and and it gathers virtual dust. But uh, it's uh, it just needs to be at the forefront of people's minds. And and again, not just to those of us professionals, but also to the politicians. You know, because ultimately they're the ones who are making the the big decisions. We started with bridge collapses and ended up with grand challenges. As a final question, I think part of that workforce question comes down to given in light of how many criminal prosecutions are underway in from Genoa, the sort of numbers on that. Not sure the exact number at the moment, but it was initially there were, uh, I think it was over 40 people being investigated, stroke cautioned, and that went from uh, junior engineers and technicians right up to company directors within Autostrada. So uh, but like everything else, the, um, the, the legal process is uh, a little bit slow, so it will take a, a, a little while yet before we're actually fully aware of, of the implications. Uh, and, and there will be reports in the interim, and, that, and there have been for other collapses. You know, the, the FIU um, collapse in, in Florida, for example, the bridge um, over the... Uh, over the freeway which was being built and uh, collapsed and again um scoss uh standing committee on structural safety have just produced a really good note uh, summarizing all the issues around uh, the fiu bridge so um but again the, the court cases the legal process will be well well and truly drawn out i'm absolutely sure but the important thing is to, to you know for all of us is, is to learn the lessons from the collapses and uh, you know there should be uh, and over the course of history you know we've all learned as bridge engineers from collapses and absolutely nothing wrong with that as long as the knowledge is shared um, what you can't afford to have is somebody has a bridge collapse and oh we'll keep that quiet we don't want anyone to know what's going on uh, but they need to recognise how important it is for all of us to, to learn the lessons. And there is a Rail Accident Investigation Board. Do you think there's a need for equivalent with bridges? Uh, well, yes. The, 
it's a it's a point I've made a few times in in various uh, meetings. And so yes, you you've got the rail accident investigation board, you've got the air accident investigation board. So anything on the railway, anything to do with air, you've got a full formalized uh, uh, investigation regime. On the on the public highway, whether it's trunk road, motorway, country lane, any collapse failure there doesn't have anything like the same investigation. And so Bridge Owners Forum, uh, certainly, and, and UKBB have been um, lobbying for, for such a, a mechanism within the, the highway sector. And it, it doesn't seem to be you know, too much of an issue. Um, I just, my, my big fear is uh, there will be a collapse and there will be some fatalities and only after that will somebody whether it's in government or wherever will say gosh what we need is a a, a highway bridge investigation board you know let's let's set one up but let's do it now let's get it set up beforehand and then you know we can all be slightly more confident that and again that even that having that board available to do those investigations is a bit of a wake up call you know people would say oh better take this seriously it's, and i'm not saying that people are taking unnecessary risks or uh, gambling or taking chances if if they maybe you know they're just not aware of of the risk you know, they, I mentioned Hammersmith and Fourth Road Bridge. The guys there had eyes wide open. My fear is around the country there are people with eyes wide shut. You know, they're just they're just not aware of what the issues are. And maybe again, the the idea of an investigation would would help. Thank you for your time. Have a nice day. Cheers. Bye. Yeah, and you. Cheers. Bye.